Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to my session. So my session title is Unlocking the Power of Kubernetes for AI. So um, today I'll be discussing how we can unlock the power of Kubernetes when it comes to uh, utilizing the Kubernetes environment for AI workloads. First of all, I want to introduce myself. So my name is Brandon Kang. I'm a working for Akamai Technologies. I belong to a compute technology group for APJ market, including the great China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. And my position is a principal technical solutions architect. So I'm dealing with the cloud business as well as the Kubernetes AI uh, for Akamai. So, so maybe you know that Akamai is famous for CDN and security companies. But two years ago, we acquired uh, Renault, the, which was uh, the cloud vendor, cloud service provider the based in Philadelphia in the US. So after that, uh, we started the cloud business as well. So first of all, I believe that most of you in this room do understand why Kubernetes, what are the benefits of the Kubernetes. So back to the basic and remind, so it gives us the scalability, the portability. So uh, I think the, the major reason why we are using the Kubernetes for auto scaling, for pod and nodes and clusters and portability, it does not matter where the Kubernetes are located in. So it can be on-prem, it can be a cloud, or it can be in the hybrid environment. And thanks to its uh, self-healing uh, for zero downtime demand applications, we can learn it on the Kubernetes. And extensibility, you know that the Kubernetes has, Kubernetes ecosystem has a lot of open sources. So in this KubeCon event, maybe you see the, a lot of open sources regarding the Kubernetes environment. So, so uh, this extensibility uh, make us more flexible to when we build the application on the Kubernetes environment and resource optimization. So I will consume the most of my time on session about the resource optimization regarding the ZPU. So uh, it's very easy uh, to manage the resource allocation for GPU, uh, CPU, sometimes the disk, the memory. So that's that's very important for application developers. Uh, and then this gives us only focusing on the developments, not thinking about the environments. And automated the rollout and rollbacks that give us the effective DevOps CI C D pipelines. And then just one command is enough for rollout and rollback. And service so discovery by using the Kubernetes internal DNS, external DNS by load balancer that's provided by the CSPs and et cetera. So yeah, this, these are the major reasons why we are using the Kubernetes. So thinking about the deploy AI workload on the Kubernetes, so it gives us the dynamic resource scaling, the first, the, and then um, when we have the burst workload, for example, if we start AI training, and then very faster the auto scaling feature is the demand. So, and then another one, the shared infrastructure. So we can have the multiple Kubernetes cluster for learning the AI workload and CPU and TPU management, the Kubernetes support scheduling and managing the specialized hardware like the CPU and T TPUs optimizing their utilization for AI workload. So you can see that the most of these factors are the common factors with the Kubernetes the benefits. So that's why we deploy AI on the Kubernetes. So uh, let me skip very basic uh, contents. So maybe you can read these contents on my slide, the PDF attached to the schedule.com in this uh, schedule. But if in brief, it gives us the resource management as well as cost management. So 
cost management is very important. So most of Kubernetes cluster are running on cloud environment, as you know. So instead of the building your DIY Kubernetes workload, uh, we are utilizing cloud. But the cost is the pain in the neck that when we utilize the cloud environments. So thinking about if we use the GPU more than two hours, three hours for AI training, so it will give us an invoice of well under 1,000 US dollars. So efficient resource management helps in controlling cost, especially in cloud environments. And sometimes we need the CRDs, the custom resource definitions. So you know that the Kubernetes allows the creation of the CRDs to support your own a specialized AI workload and requirement. And it's very easy to integrate with the AI frameworks and tools, which are very famous in the ecosystem. For example, the frameworks like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and commercial version of the NVIDIA, Nemo, and Passion, uh, these uh, frameworks and tools, uh, they give us the seamless deployment and operation of AI models and very low learning curve, and then it does not ask the Earth to very high learning curve, and they easy, and it gives us agility as well. So one research from the Red Hat, you can see that why organizations deploy workload on containers like the Kubernetes. So 74% of the responders, they say, uh, because the Kubernetes has the consistency across environment, it does not matter if we use the multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, or private cloud, and agility. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, I mentioned that the Kubernetes has the agility, so you know only developers they can focus on development of their application. And then infrastructure management team, they build the Kubernetes and then they prefer Kubernetes resources and host level resources like GPU or CPU and memory. Uh, it gives us the faster development and agility. And the second reason is the portability that from the uh, multiple environment like hybrid, um, the private or something. So these five reasons of the deploying AI on Kubernetes, actually now you can find out that these factors are the same as the Kubernetes, uh, the, the benefits, yeah, it's the same. So another research from the Red Hat, what kind of the types of workload are running on the Kubernetes recently? Uh, I was surprised that the number one software was the database. Actually, I didn't deploy the database or caching solutions on the Kubernetes uh, due to very high level of the synchronization, data synchronization among the multiple clusters. But anyway, the responders say that uh, they make their database clusters on the Kubernetes environment. And AI machine learning software like uh, Jupyter Notebooks, Python, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, they are running on their Kubernetes. So 65% of responders, they say uh, Kubernetes environment is, is uh, their favorite, second favorite one to deploy the, this kind of the applications. But if we're thinking about the deploying AI on the Kubernetes, the first of all, you have a question how uh, we can decide the GPUs. What kind of models, how many GPUs, what kind of specs of the GPU we have to use. First of all, we need to clearly understand the difference between CPU and GPU. So you can see that the GPU has some multiple cores than the CPU. And then actually, the, you know, the GPU is for GPU was born for the graphics processing, often referred to a graphics card, and it's a specialized microprocessor 
for computer chip originally designed to accelerate the graphics rendering, but thanks to its uh, the parallelism and simultaneous multiprocessing, uh, now the GPU is more famous for learning, helping the learning AI workload on their machines. So, uh, if you decide to run an AI workload on the Kubernetes, uh, first of all, we have to thinking about, we have to consider what kind of the GPUs and how many, and how much cost we will will spend for the GPUs. So, uh, first of all, we need to think about the dynamic resource allocation and costs as well, and multi-cloud strategies. So, um, even I'm from a cloud vendor, so I don't say the vendor lock-in. So, multi-cloud strategy means that sometimes you need A type of a CPU, B type of a GPU, and if you think the different cloud vendors has different cost model, and if you think the, their pricing model is more proper to your organization, you can use the multi-cloud for buying the GPU for your AI workloads. And also, we need to think about cost efficiency and how to dynamically allocate the GPU resources. You know, uh, if you buy a GPU VM and it costs you uh, $200 for an hour, for example, it should not be underutilized and it should not be overutilized as well. So, you know, resource lo allocation is very important considering the Kubernetes, uh, utilizing the GPUs on the Kubernetes environment. And then, after that, we need to think about what kind of device plugins. And if your GPU vendor supports you, the device plugins, software, and the guidelines, how to use that. And then, GPU vendor integration is also important. So, uh, fortunately, the Kubernetes has very strong integration with GPU technologies. For example, uh, NVIDIA, they provide the Kubernetes device plugins and CUDA. So, making it easier to leverage these GPUs on your applications. So, uh, this setup enhances the performance, ensures efficient resource utilization as well. This means that uh, you don't need to think, uh, consider how to allocate the resource by your own, but thanks to this device plugin software, it has a feature of monitoring the current GPU utilization, and that they can share your workload, and even they can uh, make some load balancers for the GPU resource allocation. So, the integration of automation, advanced GPU management, and security features program makes Kubernetes an ideal platform for uh, deploying and managing GPU accelerate AI workload. And device plugin software give us automatic GPU discovery as well as resource allocation and health checks as well. So, uh, no matter what kind of the GPU vendors you are using, it's like it can be NVIDIA, AMD, uh, the most of the device plugins software has the features like that. So, not every uh, application is not ideal for the Kubernetes. So, thinking about small scale project, or if you have very limited resource, for, for example, your organization has a just small budget for having uh, just one number of the GPU thinking about it. You know, it does mean that Kubernetes auto-scaling feature does not mean anything to you, right? It's only one. So, uh, no matter it is underutilized or overutilized, so there is no workaround for that. And high initial setup and learning curve. So, um, even the GPU vendors, they provide us the plugin software and libraries. Uh, maybe many of uh, you agree with me that the installation and initialization is not easy. So based on the operating system, 
kind of operating system you use. It can be a Linux, a Windows, and anything. So very uh, different. So I found out that I was using the Debian 11, and there was no problem to install the NVIDIA, the CUDA, and libraries, and container toolkit. After I changed it to Debian 12 version, uh, on its expected issues happen repeatedly, and then uh, I, I spent uh, more than three hours to troubleshoot the kind of the issue. So real time or low latency application. So uh, I will talk about how we can overcome this kind of the requirement. But the thing is that if you really need a real time a low latency applications. Uh, Kubernetes is not ideal, or you have to build your multiple Kubernetes cluster in the world where your end users are located in. For example, in Hong Kong, in the US, in Japan, everywhere where your end users are in. So, you know, we know that edge computing is why demanding. This is because the end users are also demanding. They want the faster response from their service, and then, you know, the engagement ratio of the the service is um, the, one of the the most important factor is the performance metrics, right? The, thinking about the web page, the latency. So it's, if it, the loading time is more than three seconds, so many people leave the walmart.com, the website. It's uh, reported by the Walmart research teams. So AI workload is the same. So, uh, you know, we have to be very tolerated when we start the AI training. You know, if we have the good, nice GPUs, it takes only five minutes or some time it consumes more than one hour. So a real-time low latency application, we need to think about not AI training, but uh, AI inference uh, is most suitable to the options for the kind of the applications. Okay, move on. So uh, many services like uh, this image is captured from the hugging pace. So they have, they displayed it, they, they display uh, the recommended the GPU types. So it's a kind of requirement as well. So if you cannot decide uh, which AI model requires what kind of the GPUs, maybe you can refer to this kind of the guidelines uh, provided by the AI models, the providers. So this picture is from the inter inference and the point pace, uh, for example, they have in the page, you can see the many uh, text generation models. Um, they display you and uh, what kind of GPUs and at least you need. So uh, when you decide the GPU allocation, so first one, uh, thinking about if our service is AI training or our service is AI inference, so very different. So for example, uh, if you're learning, if you are learning the AI training service, at least the floating point is 64, 32, and 16 supported GPU is necessary for your service. For example, NVIDIA Ampere 100 series, V100 series, and H100 series, for example. But uh, if your service is AI inference, which means that you got another AI model, train, already trained the AI model from another vendors, and all you have to do is AI inference. This process is usually less resource intensive compared to AI training, and it only may uh, only require a single GPU or a fraction of it. For example, floating point 16 and integer eight supported GPUs like NVIDIA T4 series and NVIDIA 810. NVIDIA Javier or NVIDIA RTX series, etc. So uh, this test uh, from mine, I uh, utilize the CIPA 10 data set. You know, uh, this is a very legacy data set as well. 
uh, but um, it's, uh, it consists of the label, the subset of the 18 million tiny images data set. Actually, it consists of the 60,000 small images in 10 classes. You can see that there is an airplane, automobile, bird, cat, deer. And then they have the 60,000 images for uh, totally and 6,000 images for class. So uh, you can see that the training code is more, looks like more complex than inference model. So uh, not only development side, but also uh, if you see the result. So first the results come from the inference. And second, result is come from API, uh, the AI training. So I tested this code uh, using the animal.jpg file, which is a horse. And then you can see that the probability from inference and training is different because I'm not sure how many times, uh, what kind of epoch, how many epoch they used for making uh, this kind of AI models, but for sure, I trained this model more than 10 times at the time the loss was there. And then I have 90%, 90% about 90% of the probability that it makes sure that it is a horse. So in this kind, if I measure the GPU, the UC's allocation, very different. So also uh, getting some result from these two types of the AI uh, trainings and inference is different. So uh, you need to decide which service, which kind of service you will apply to your organization. And uh, there, is a tools, there are tools like the GPU operator and automated the node labeling, labeling from the Kubernetes feature. So, uh, fortunately, the Kubernetes also have how to allocate the GPU resources for your AI workload. So GPU operators, like uh, in Kubernetes, uh, it, is, it helps us to manage the GPU resources effectively, and it helps us dynamic allocation for better resource utilization. So not only the container toolkit or uh, you know the CUDA or NVIDIA GPU driver, we need to set up GPU operator. If you need, get some help for GPU allocation. And automated nodal labeling is a very basic feature from the Kubernetes. It is used for not only GPU, but also it's used for CPU or disk or your memory. Also, it supports a mixed workload on the same GPU. Uh, so NVIDIA recently say that uh, you can use the multi-instance GPU. It means that one single GPU can be partitioned to, into the multiple instances. And then dynamic allocation based on the load, it means that it monitors how much load your GPU have, and then if it is too high, the service will be goes to another GPUs. So, uh, these two techniques are uh, recently introduced and uh, it is very crucial for the AI developers how to allocate the GPU resource is the major problem or the major factor to develop your AI service successfully. So like a hug and paste, the NVIDIA, they displayed you know, what kind of uh, your GPU should be for certain the LMM models or AI models. For example, Llama 3, 8 million model only need eight, uh, one or two GPUs in a certain model. But when it comes to the Llama 3, 70 billion model, they need at least four GPUs and eight or eight GPUs to ensure the throughput and latency from the GPU. So this kind of the guidelines will help you uh, how to decide the number of GPUs, the specs of GPUs you need. And then another factor, not only GPU, but VRAM is uh, also important factor. 
So VLAM is actually crucial when you need to handle the large models, uh, high resolution data, or large batch sizes. So GPU power is crucial when you need to process tasks quickly, but the VLAM is important how much the memory you need for restore some data sets, some batch files from the GPU. So in most AI workload, both GPU and VLAMs are essential. And the importance of the each depends on the specific requirement of your task. So generally, you cannot ignore one in favor of the other. So uh, optimal performance is achieved when both are properly provisioned according to the workload need. So not only GPU, so VLAM is also important. So in the spec specification page of your GPU vendor, there is a GPU memory factor. Uh, in this example, this is a 20 gigabyte the GDDR, so which means the graphics do data late. Sometimes GPU memory, the VRAM is HBM type, high bandwidth memory. It's a total difference. So you need to carefully take, uh, verify what kind of the VRAM your GPU has. So for example, this is a very simple YAML file to schedule the AI resource to your GPU. So this is a part, and then you know there is a resource pool and limit pool to identify what kind of GPU and how many you need uh, for learning this part. And then there is a toleration pool, and and uh, this means that what kind of node? If you have uh, more than ten work node and only five work node has the GPU, then you should be thinking about the tolerations and thinking about the what will be the key and value to tolerate and make some taint uh, for your workload. So this is a job. So uh, job is you know used for the keeping the trainings. Uh, AI trainings by the, the uh, Kubernetes. So you can see that the uh, there is only one the GPU the request. Actually, this YAML file checks that if your Kubernetes cluster detect the GPU on your host level. So before starting the AI workload service, we need to verify that if our GPU is detected by your Kubernetes cluster. So. Uh, schedule the resource with the GPU. You can use the limit, you can use the request, and toleration as well. Also, uh, you can make your own uh, dynamic label like this, and then you can use the node affinity to select, to make the part select your the proper the work node. Another feature is NFT, which means the node feature discovery. So, you don't need to make your own labels. Uh, you, need to, you don't need to type in the kubectl, the label command, uh, thanks to NFT feature. So this feature automatically detects the hardware specs of your work node, like this, and then it makes the label. So uh, after installation of the NFT, you can use node select pill and then uh, the label created by NFT is start with the picture dot node dot Kubernetes. For an example, this node, uh, this part, ask that I should be in a node which has the PCI 10DE interface. So this is detected by NFT, not by a developers nor uh, the Kubernetes administrator, but automatically detected by NFD feature. So another example, fully defined that NFD enable us to use node affinity to schedule this part onto a node. Okay, so thinking about the famous in the Kubernetes cases of the learning the AI. So this is NVIDIA NIM service, which means the NVIDIA Inference Microservice for Jane AI. You can see that the, their microservices for AI utilization is 
learn on the top of the Kubernetes. And thinking about the machine learning, the workflows, the Qflow helpers, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, also they are helping us to learning the AI or machine learning workload on your Kubernetes clusters. In the serving stage, the core case serve, the TensorFlow are serving as a famous framework to help you to solve your AI models. Thinking about how to deploy AI machine learning on the Kubernetes, we have this kind of the pros. So developers develop their AI application code, the build to repository, make it the container images, then deploy it to Kubernetes. And then the consumers, they will be access to Kubernetes cluster via the public internet. Uh, there should be uh, some secure matter to block some unsecure the traffic from, uh, from the internet use, utilizing the firewall. And there should be a load balancer to share the traffic to the multiple Kubernetes clusters. This is uh, how uh, makes uh, this kind of the workflows. Uh, I will share, uh, I shared my the GitHub URLs for uh, all of the, this code and script so you can see in time uh, after this session. So I will skipping it so because we are learn, uh, already learning out of time. So uh, this is one example, PyTorch example. First of all, we need to use the NVIDIA system management interface tool if my GPU is running properly. And then, if I, if I learn this Py, PyTorch code, uh, you can see that there is a several epoch trainings are repeated. And then we can see how much the GPU resource was used for this kind of the training, uh, thanks to NVIDIA SMI tools. So developers, they need uh, multiple terminals when they learn the, when they start the AI the training and the check if your GPU resource is enough for this kind of the trainings. Yeah, this is for Dockify, how to make uh, this AI service uh, to the container images. And then one of the example of the YAML file, how to make the part of your Kubernetes. Okay, so uh, my final topic is for the demand for distributed clouds. So this is my almost the last part of the, this session. So we are here in the Hong Kong. So thinking about, uh, we want to use the AI inference hosted by some LMM microservice vendor located in the US. So there can be a internet peculous, high latency performance can be happen because they are too far. And then we use the public internet or not, you know, uh, we cannot make any dedicated lines between two points because it's too far away. So thinking about uh, this kind of the demands makes the distributed cloud, edge computing, like that. So the cloud the next phase requires a shift in how developers and enterprise think about getting application data across their customers. So not only cloud, what about having the cloud Kubernetes cluster close to, to closer to the end users and developers? So the next gen, the Kubernetes clusters, they should be in the core computing regions, which means run by the most hyperscaler cloud service providers in the famous city and country. And not only core computing region, the distributed regions, edge computing side, no matter what types of there, it can be a CDM pops as well. There will be a computing machines with uh, GPUs. So this image illustrates a global infrastructure for distributed Kubernetes cluster on the cloud environment, especially optimized for AI workflow. So they can be very close to the end users. And then this satisfies the performance metrics uh, asked by the end users uh, 
in the world. Okay, this is my last slide of this session, and then I will share my uh, example code and script on my GitHub. And thank you for your time and attention. I, ha I hope that this session was helpful to understand, uh, even though you are a very basic level, uh, what kind of the consideration you have to have to learning AI workload on the Kubernetes. And thanks a lot for your time. And then if you have any question, I will stand by the out of this room and then you can ask me any question. Uh, I would welcome any discussion. Thank you.